Hello everyone and welcome back to Space Basics. In the previous video I discussed how rockets work in general, how they're based on the law of conservation of momentum, and what ISP, specific impulse, and delta V are. In this video I'm going to talk about how rocket engines work. This is not as strictly necessary for a game like Kerbal Space Program, uh, not compared to delta V in ISP for instance, uh, because the games already have the engines set up for you. However, it is interesting as, from a curiosity standpoint. Uh, so let's take a look at exactly what's going on here. The first obstacle for space is that we can't just suck in air to get our oxygen. The kind of engine that I'm going to be talking about is a chemical combustion engine, which is by far the most common for space applications. There are also ion engines and eventually, hopefully, somebody will develop a nuclear engine, but uh, those will set off to the side. For a, com a chemical combustion engine, you need a fuel, which I'll label F, and an oxidizer, which we will label O. As the name implies, the most common oxidizer is oxygen. And basically, with your car, uh, the fuel is the gasoline, and the car will suck in air, and it will take the oxygen from the air in order to ignite the gasoline. And in a jet engine, the jets have these huge air intakes, they suck in the air, and they take the oxygen from the air, and they ignite their jet fuel. Uh, with a rocket, we cannot do that. With a rocket, we have to carry the oxygen with us, and that is a huge burden that we would like to avoid. However, because the rockets, as we saw in the previous video, uh, do not stay in the atmosphere for very long, we can't just create a jet-rocket hybrid very easily. Uh, there's no point trying to suck it in, because we only spend about a minute in the region where, say, jet, jet engines operate. So maybe one or two minutes. And then the vast majority of the launch is in space already, or at least where we can't suck in much air. So we carry the oxidizer with us, and it's usually the heavier part. The fuel is normally lighter than the oxidizer. So it is a pain, but we do it uh, because we have to. And these two get mixed by, uh, they get introduced by an injector plate. And this injector plate at the top of the engine ensures that the fuel and oxidizer get mixed efficiently so that all of it combusts. All of it does the reaction and there's not spare fuel and spare oxidizer that can create turbulence or do other bad things. Because this is a high pressure situation and bad things can happen if you don't do it right. So the design of an injector plate is not something that I can even explain to you because it really, it either takes a lot of testing or it takes some really fancy software. So just keep that in mind. Yeah, that, that's the most finicky part. The second most finicky part is the turbo pump. That's that thing there. The turbo pump is there to ensure that the fuel and oxidizer, or you could have more than one turbo pump, Fuel and oxidizer get shoved into the combustion chamber. That's that there. At the rate that you need in order to produce the thrust that you want. So, last time we talked about uh, throwing out a mass at a certain velocity, which we call the exhaust velocity, right? So this is a sort of critical equation. Um, not so much for Kerbal Space Program, but it'll help explain some stuff in Kerbal Space Program. Uh, but in space in general, thrust is equal to how much mass you throw out per second, mass per second, times the exhaust velocity. Hopefully this is clear from what we discussed in the previous video. Because what was happening in the previous video is we were throwing out a mass at a certain velocity and we got thrust in the opposite direction. And the only caveat is, if we multiply just the mass with the exhaust velocity, then what we would get is the momentum. In order to get the force, you have to divide by some sort of speed factor. And so it's mass per second times the exhaust velocity is the thrust. And exhaust velocity, again, is ISP times 2 in approximation 9.81. I need to clarify that I call this gravity. Um, it is just a conversion factor here. It is not your local gravity or anything like that. Uh, so it is Earth's gravity at the surface, but that is just being used as a conversion factor. 
in order to get the quantity specific impulse or ISP, which is has unit seconds that everybody can relate to. So all the yeah, engine efficient and that is the engine efficiency. All the engine efficiencies in Kerbal Space Program will be written in seconds, and that avoids the need for weird uh, units. But another way to read this is that the specific impulse is. It, it, let, let's move this over here. Uh, so this is the mass flow, this one. So this is called the mass flow rate. Mass flow rate. It's the rate at which you're shoving things out the back. If you move this over here, you'll see that thrust, I keep missing the R there, divided by the mass flow equals ISP times 9.81. And a way of reading this is that the specific impulse is telling you how long it's going to take you to burn a ton of fuel at a given thrust, at one kilonewton, let's say. So that's what the seconds are. The seconds are how long is it going to take you to burn a ton of fuel at a given thrust, at one kilonewton the thrust. And obviously, if the specific impulse, that time, is higher, then the engine is more efficient. Now, what creates a more efficient engine? So that's an interpretation. Uh, what, what creates a more efficient engine? Well, the first thing and most important thing is your choice of fuel and oxidizer. That's because for any combination of a fuel and an oxidizer, there is a theoretical maximum velocity that they can be shot out the back. Okay, so there's a limit for any given one. And so one option is what's called RP1 or uh, rocket grade kerosene and oxygen. That's used on Falcon 9. Another common op option these days is CH4 or methane and oxygen. Another co a common option is hydrogen and oxygen. And then these are sort of normal combustion ones. And then there are hypergolic ones that don't need any sort of special ignition apparatus. Once they come in contact with each other, they will automatically combust. And one option there is NMH and nitrogen tetroxide. Now here, note the oxide, right? The oxide is the, uh, the important part there, though you don't have to have oxygen as your, uh, in your oxidizer. For instance, H2 and fluorine will work. The problem with fluorine being the oxidizer is it likes to eat through tanks. So we haven't actually had an in, oops, I don't want to do that. We haven't actually had a in-flight use of fluorine for that reason. So MMH and NTO, monomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide will just ignite in contact. So they're simpler that way. Uh, they are storable uh, as opposed to all the oxygens. This is liquid oxygen, so it has to be kept at a really cold temperature, right? Otherwise, oxygen at normal temperatures is a gas, but a gas would take a lot of volume. So we need to keep them liquid, and that means that it's not so easy to store. Uh, anyway, but the efficiency of these, remember, the efficiency is exhaust velocity, or if you want to think about ISP, I'll write the approximation in both. So exhaust velocity of RP1, let's say 3,000 roughly. It depends on where you're at, or uh, 300 uh, to 350 is the normal range for that. So it'd be 3,000 to 3,500. Uh, um, sort of 3,200 here, but the normal range would be 320 uh, to three, maybe 370. You could get higher or lower than that. There's just like the normal range. I'm not saying there's like the limit or anything. And then for hydrogen and oxygen, that's usually the most favorable combination. You get 4,000 and what you call it? It's about this range, 400 to 460 and on the ISP. Now, then you'd ask, why wouldn't you use hydrogen and oxygen? All of these have their benefits and drawbacks. The main drawback is the hydrogen here. It has to be stored even colder than the oxygen, really, really, really cold. And it also isn't very dense, so you need bigger tanks. So that's why 
uh, that can have a drawback even though it has a really nice efficiency. Again, this is just a speed that it goes out the back. Very simple. Okay, so we've discussed the uh, we, we've discussed the injector and the turbo pump is making sure that the mass flow. So that's the mass flow rate there. The turbo pump is the mass flow rate, and remember that determines our thrust. Now, if you don't need much thrust, maybe you don't need a turbo pump. And in that case, if you don't have a turbo pump and the tank is just shoving the stuff into the combustion chamber directly. That is known as a pressure-fed engine, and that means that the pressure of the tank is feeding it directly without any sort of pump. But that, me that limits how quickly you can pump the stuff, uh, how quickly you can send the stuff into the combustion chamber, and that means that the pressure of the combustion chamber, this part here, is going to be very low. What you want is this to be a very high pressure, generally speaking, and it's going to be high temperature whether you like it or not, so you're going to need to cool it. And the velocity, it's basically stagnant. In other words, the stuff that's combusting in there is not going anywhere for the time being. It'll eventually go somewhere, but it's just hanging out there, blowing up. <laughs> but not really blowing up. But And the volume is sort of constant as well, right? It's just a set volume there. Okay, uh, so high pressure, very high pressure. And the... The more confined you make it, the higher pressure, higher pressure it is. If you want your engine, if it's okay for your engine to be bigger, you can make that lower pressure for the same thrust. So if you have a certain mass flow rate with the thur turbo pump, you're pumping in all this stuff into the chamber. If you have a bigger chamber, you can have a lower pressure and that'll be easier to build. And for the Raptor engine that SpaceX is making right now, they are trying to fit a whole lot of engines on a small area. So they need their engines to have a very high pressure combustion chamber so they can fit them all and so that they'll all be very tight. And so they want to get as much thrust from a small volume, a small area, so that, you know, it can lift off. So that's why they have a high pressure engine. But that's not necessarily ideal for your application. If you can have a low pressure engine and it'll fit, then that's fine. You know, you have to think about, okay, well, the rocket's this big. I need this much thrust out of it. So I need this much. So the thrust is, uh, given that the efficiency is set by your propellant, the thrust is directly related to the mass flow rate. So you need a certain mass flow rate. And if you have a certain mass flow rate, that tells you how much stuff you're feeding into the chamber. And then the pressure is completely dependent on exactly how much volume you're willing to take. If you can build, uh, if you got this vol uh, this uh, sort of cross section, you, you, you can't have an engine that's going like this. It'd be really ridiculous, right? But if you wanted to have very low pressure, you could do that, but that's difficult. So that's, you know, those are the constraints. So you can make a smaller engine, but also another benefit to having a smaller engine and having a high pressure is that the engine has less mass, right? Making the big engine means it's more massive. So making a high pressure engine like the Raptor engine means that your engine is lighter and that can be very helpful because this is a very heavy part. And also it could be cheaper that way too because less material. Okay, so what's happening with the rest of the engine? All the rest of the engine after the combustion chamber is known as the nozzle. Sometimes people think of the nozzle as just the part after the throat. This pinch point is known as the throat. Okay, and this type of nozzle was developed originally for steam engines to sort of optimize the effect of the production of steam in those. And it's called a convergent divergent nozzle. That means it squishes together first. This is the convergent part. And then it expands out. This is the divergent part. And the point where it inflects the throat, that's the throat still, uh, the throat is where the flow, the stuff that's moving, the combustion products, the stuff that's going through the engine, is at the speed of sound. And that's because of a quirk in the equations where if it is below the speed of sound, then as the volume decreases, as volume goes down, so for this part, the volume is going down. And sorry, uh, this big V, 
and then the velocity, little v, is going up. Temperature is going up and pressure is going up. Uh, out here, the pressure is going to be really low. Temperature is going to be really low. V velocity is going to be really high. And the volume is really high. So what happens is, below the speed of sound, as volume goes down, speed goes up. After the speed of sound, as volume goes up, the velocity goes up. And that's just how the equations work. Now, you could go like, well, that, that you could just keep extending the nozzle out and get even more velocity in, right? Well, first of all, the chemistry of it has a limit. So there's diminishing returns to that. Second of all, uh, your mass of the engine is going to go up a lot if you keep making the nozzle longer. Uh, third of all, there is another thing going on. And that is, what if you're in the atmosphere? Well, if you're in the atmosphere, the air is going to push back at a pressure of one atmosphere, or 14.7 psi, or other units, 101.3 uh, 101 kilopascals, whatever you like. So if you're at the surface, right here at the end, you want this to be at 14.7 psi or one atmosphere or what have you. Now the pressure inside the combustion chamber is really high. It could be 3,000 psi or it could be 1,000, 3,000. Really the range is anything above like 100 will be fine. Uh, 100 psi is, uh, even less than 100 psi can work. But basically it's exactly a matter of how much you can fit and how much thrust you want. So uh, the higher the pressure, the more thrust you get out of a small volume. That's it. And so out here, it's going to go down by a lot. You can see the pressure goes down tremendously by the time you get to the end of the nozzle. But basically, you want the end of the nozzle to match the ambient situation. The problem is that the rocket is going to get into vacuum really quickly. So eventually, there's not going to be any air. And so then your nozzle could be infinitely long if you want, but of course that would make it really heavy. So we don't make it like that. So now this whole business, it's, it's weird conceptually that expanding something out is going to accelerate it. But one way to think about it, and this is just one, one conceptual thing, is at the molecular level. Uh, right over here, while it's below the speed of sound, it's getting funneled by the other particles. You know, you've got all these little particles and they're bouncing all over the place. But you can funnel them in and direct them into the same direction so that they're all going out in this direction, right? When we talk about the speed of the exhaust, we're talking about the average. The molecules are all bouncing all over the place uh, oftentimes. So there could be one that's going askew like that, right? Or, or like that. While the flow is below the speed of sound, they interact with each other. Sound is the propagation of a wave through the molecules. They're bumping into each other and they convey sound. But once it's past the speed of sound, they're not bumping into each other like that anymore. So what you need is that the nozzle, if they're askew still, if they're trying to bounce like that, you want the nozzle, so when they hit the nozzle, to redirect them. So at any given point, the nozzle is designed to redirect some particle that's going like that into the direction of the desired flow so that we don't get these uh, askew lines because that's inefficient, right? The gap between uh, this line and that line is energy lost, right? That's not going in the direction that we want it to go in that molecule. That straight molecule. And you'll see this in jet engines, uh, not jet engines, rocket engines in vacuum. What happens is their nozzle isn't, you know, infinitely long. So you'll get a flare, right? Uh, the exhaust will sort of flare out. And all those molecules that were going in this direction, well, that energy is not going where we wanted them to go, right? Uh, what you want them to go is straight out the back like this. So the design of the nozzle is to make them go as straight out the back as possible, and that's where you get your efficiency from, uh, making sure that they're all flowing like this, because it's no longer the case once they're past the speed of sound that they're going to push each other into this direction. They, they'll push each other until you get to the speed of sound, and that's how you can funnel them in. But past the speed of sound, you can't funnel them in like that.
So you re rely on them bouncing off of the walls to go into this direction. So that's the design of the nozzle. That's why it's curved that way. Uh, now, calculating that curve, I'll leave to you. Uh, so that's the explanation of how that works. But, I mean, that's just a conceptual explanation. Ultimately, all these things come down to equations, and I'm uh, deliberately avoiding a lot of that. So, let me think about what else I might need to discuss. Well, a term that you'll hear fairly often uh, when talking about rocket engines is the nozzle ratio. So, the numbers that you'll encounter when people talk about rocket engines is the thrust, which is the force that it provides. And again, that is related to the mass flow rate. And again, in the previous video, that's related to the Hulk throwing out tons every second, basically. And another number that you're going to have is the chamber pressure. So chamber pressure. And again, that determines how small you can make the engine for a given thrust. And another number, uh, the specific impulse we've already talked about, another number is the nozzle ratio. And the nozzle ratio is the ratio of the area, not the diameter. I've sort of drawn the diameter, but it's the area at the end of nozzle end. divided by the area of the throat. Area of the nozzle end divided by the area of the throat. The higher this number is, the more optimized the engine is for vacuum. So the sea level engines, because they have to deal with the atmosphere, are going to have a smaller number for this nozzle ratio. And the vacuum engines are going to have a higher number for this nozzle ratio. The higher the nozzle ratio, the more efficient uh, engine is in vacuum. But if it's a high nozzle ratio, then it also risks at sea level for the air getting in and causing turbulence in the flow and causing problems and potential instability. So for the sea level engines, they'll have a shorter nozzle. And let's take a look at an example of this. Um, my own little makeshift designs. Uh, the ED... 9 engine, which is a huge hydrogen-oxygen uh, engine for the surface. You can see by its curve that it's surface laid. The throat is fairly wide here compared to the end of the nozzle. And But there is a vacuum version of this. The same engine has an additional fitting here, and this additional fitting allows it to operate in vacuum. And now you see that the area of the end of the nozzle is much, much higher than it originally was. And so this is operating in vacuum, but it wouldn't be good at sea level because the air would get in, because the air would have higher pressure than the thrust coming out and therefore create some instability. So we wouldn't use this on the ground. Uh, this is the one that we would use on the ground, but it would be this one will be less efficient in space than that one. So that's the trade-off. And if we take a look at the numbers, uh, this one, uh, see the kilonewtons is the thrust, and it is always going to be the case that the thrust at sea level is less than the thrust at, at vacuum because of the interaction with the air. So there is an equation for that, and basically you just subtract out the pa uh, pressure from the air. And, but by vacuum, it'll get better. And at sea level, you have lower specific impulse. And in vacuum, you have higher specific impulse. So the stuff going out the nozzle is slower because it is hitting the air. Remember, the fact that the molecules don't interact with each other is only within the flow. That has nothing to do with how they interact with other things like the wall of the nozzle or the air, which they encounter. So they're going to get slowed down by the air. And, but in vacuum, they don't have to worry about that, so it's always more efficient in vacuum. Uh, so this is 385 seconds of specific impulse at sea level. 434 in vacuum is a hydrogen-oxygen engine. And you can see the mass flow rate here. Uh, 157 kilograms per second hydrogen, uh, 786 kilograms per second oxygen. That is all down to chemistry, how you figure out what the mix is and what kind of temperature you want. Uh, for this really big nozzle, you can see 224 sea level, so it's much, much worse at sea level, but somewhat better in vacuum, 
456. But it's not so huge a difference. It's not like it's not even a 10% difference. It's like a 5% improvement on this with that huge nozzle. So that's why you have to think you don't want to keep expanding that nozzle until it's ridiculous. Well, it's already pretty ridiculously big because it's got to be heavier and you really want that extra mass for the 5% difference that it gives you. So that's the balance that we talk about when it comes to getting a vacuum engine. Uh, there are engines that operate just fine at both sea level and vacuum. Uh, for instance, the Space Shuttle main engine, this isn't the best uh, model of it, but the Space Shuttle main engine worked at sea level and also worked in vacuum. And that was because of the, it has a sort of nifty design to its nozzle too. Uh, but it's good enough at sea level, 363, and it gets 459 seconds ISP in vacuum. So, yeah, that, uh, it was a fairly unique engine and very good at its job. Anyway, there are plenty of topics that I could discuss when it comes to rocket engines, but I think this has gone on enough. Uh, I'll rely on you guys asking questions in the comments in order to tell me what else I should cover about this. And yeah, uh, this could be a long thing and I could work through the equations, but we don't want that. The only equation that I think you really should keep in mind is the thrust equation. So the thrust equation again, thrust equals exhaust velocity, and you could write them either way, times mass flow rate. And one thing I'll note is uh, as far as units are concerned, of course, uh, we will normally, and 9.81 is only in metric, right? If you're using uh, American units, it'll be 32, I think it's 0.2 feet per second. And you're like, I have to do everything in feet per second, so just please don't. Um, I don't even know what the gra surface gravity acceleration is in miles per hour or anything like that. But uh, yeah, it's normally say in feet per second. But the exhaust velocity, uh, it will be in meters per second uh, if you're using metric. And the mass flow rate, if this is, if the thrust you're measuring is in newtons, then the mass flow rate should be in kilograms per second. If the thrust you're measuring is in kilonewtons, then you want tons per second, metric tons per second. And in Kerbal Space Program, generally it's in tons per second, except for that dialogue we had there, which was in kilograms per second. So just remember tons for kilonewtons and kilograms for newtons. Okay, so with that, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.